Hi, my name is Philip Warwick and welcome to my first deal, which ultimately led to millions. The first deal you do in real estate, no matter what your net worth, usually defines what type of investor you are. It's either the thing that inspired you the most or it was the bad one and you learned from your mistakes. And we will interview some very successful investors and in local real estate groups from all over the country so that you can get inspired. Whether, whether you are a very advanced investor or you're brand new at this. Today, we have a very big guest. We have JT Fox, who started off as a real estate investor. He's now the world's number one wealth and business coach. He's also a man who knows and owns a lot of companies all over the world. He owns all kinds of companies, but as I said, he started with real estate. And now ultimately he speaks to tens of thousands of people, does business with and knows some of the biggest celebrities in the world like Pacino, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, Julia Roberts, just to name a few. Phil Jackson, Cole Hauser, Kiefer Sutherland, I know because I've spoken at some of the same events as them as well. And it's my honor to introduce my first guest, JT. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Such an honor to have been here and being in your office here today in Houston and seeing the energies and the deals and the people calling and the deals being done and off full price offers beyond in a market that's today brought me back to a lot of old memories. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you for being here again. Um, this is called Your First Deal. And I'm here to interview people about their first deal, which led them to millions in real estate investing. Well, the funny thing is the first deal is actually the hardest. Um, because you have no confidence, you're afraid, uh, you're afraid of making offers and you're trying to wait till it's perfect. And that's obviously a mistake. And the first deal is always the luckiest, right? Because it's whenever you don't expect it. And it's the one that's most afraid. And for me, the first deal I got was, was probably one of the greatest life lessons was one of the greatest life lessons. And it was like I put a foreclosure poster, you know, uh, you know, trying to help people in foreclosure, and I got a call back. And they're like, I'm losing my house in 30 days, and please help us. We tried everyone. So I went there. It was an hour drive. And I show up, and, and it was two people in a wheelchair. And, and they said, you know, we tried everything. And I said, okay, well, I, I can do it. I had no idea what I was doing. So I think they owed the bank 320000 And I said, well, I'm going to see if I could buy it for... Um, you know, 260 or something um, and try to get a short sale for the bank and put the property on the market. So I put the property on the market for, you know, 300 and the idea was to buy 260, 240, 220 or 200, trying to get a short sale. And the guy came up and he put an offer of 420,000. Wow. Now, the house is probably worth three at the most they owe 320 so they're upside down at least by 20 grand and this guy wants to offer 420 now i'd never done a deal so it was like it so it's kind of like shocking right it's just like okay whatever and to make a long story short i'm excited because i got the bank to accept a short sale of uh 240 so i'm literally gonna make eighty thousand. Huh. and i'll tell you i'm making eighty thousand eight thousand we go to closing and let's just say the authorities were got flagged, not because of me, because that was what's called a straw buyer. They had somebody else buy it for 420, take the money in default. And the bank pulled their offer out because technically I had, it was a good short sale amount. And it was the greatest lesson I've ever learned because I ended up not doing that deal, but the people in the wheelchair were like, oh, you know, we already knew. And I felt so bad, so bad. But they said to me, well, we know of this deal and it's a little piece of land and there's an airport going there. And if you go in there and that was the first deal I did and I ended up making, was it $71,000 or something like that? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that deal, but because of them and I felt bad, I gave them money because I felt so bad. Right. And they hooked me up with the deal, but I never forgot that. And I remember the lesson of that deal is ignorance of the law or not knowing something is just an excuse. Right. And so, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And looking back now, someone puts an offer 420 and the house is worth 300, right? I put it up at 320, but if someone's gonna pay over $100,000 over list, wow. right? Like you see what I mean? It's, it's shady, but I didn't know any better. And I have never forgotten that. I think it was like 12, 14 years ago, so. Okay, so I've done a lot of short sales in my past before, and I believe in the market that we're in now, short sales are kind of coming back. 
I don't know if short sales are coming back. I mean, they may, obviously. For the people who don't know, short sale is where a bank takes less than what they're owed. So if the bank is owed, let's say, 100000 and you want to take a discount to pay off. So there's a lot of properties, a lot of equity. So the short sales are probably more likely of the people who bought house in the last two or three years. I don't know if they have equity they're upside down, so that could be. But it's definitely not 2008 material. But there hasn't been really any short sales because the property just keeps taking up, 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 and banks are having record profits, so they haven't had to discount per se. But it is an opportunity to have that. And really, the idea to get a short sale of the bank, anybody can do is basically get authorization for the seller. And the bank usually hates the borrower because they haven't been responding and they're not paying and they always have excuses where basically you have to convince them to to take less. And there's a lot of different pieces that go. You have to get the BPO, which is the board of gross price of putting the realtor team on board. Sometimes they send an appraiser. So, and it's never immediate. And then you call, sometimes you get 10 different people every time because the file is updated. So it is, uh, was fun times, but it's definitely not easy. Profitable, but not easy. Nothing short about it, right? They take a long time. Well, well, yeah, because there's a lot of different pieces and you're basically asking the bank to take less money and, you literally got to handhold the transaction from the start as well. And I don't blame it. I mean, and for the banks, it's basically a business decision at this point. But a lot of times it's not the bank that makes a decision. It's a servicer. So they have to go to the bank and get the committee approval. So there's a lot of steps. They don't teach this in books. Like I tell you that. So there's a lot of things they don't. But yeah, That's right. So one of my favorite ways of purchasing houses is buying houses subject to. Subject to is where you're taking over the payments instead of doing a short sale. If there's enough equity or the payment's low enough to where you can create a good cash flow, then I like buying houses subject to. What's been your experience with? I haven't done too many because I had partners that had a lot of cash. So it was just like, looking back, I probably could have done that. So I think I did a few and I've done a lot of deals, like over a thousand deals in my lifetime buying and sold. So, but now would be the way because it diminishes the amount of money that you have out. So you can literally take over, you know, someone says, okay, their payment is $2,000 a month. They can't afford it. There's a hundred thousand dollars equity. So I tell you what, I'll take over your payments and I'm going to give you 20 grand, 25 grand to walk away. Obviously sometimes you cannot give them money because there's not enough spread. But now with the, some people have mortgages less than 4%, right? Because of what happened. Now you're looking at six, 7%, 8% in some cases, depending on the credit. So that is probably going to be one of the best ways to even find a house for yourself. And I've never really seen a bank come back and say, oh, we're calling the loan, right? As long as the loan gets paid, they don't care. Because a lot of times they've already sold that paper to somebody else. They sold that, that paper to somebody else. And so, and if people are paying, they're paying, right? And so if someone takes over and pays, I think they'll be more than happy. Okay. So one of the questions that people ask all the time is like, what's in it for me? So when you're talking with a seller, like what's the benefit of them allowing us to take over their payments? Well, number one, chances are if they're taking over payments because they're behind, right? I mean, right. every time, right? So here's the thing. You may lose your payment. You may not have the ability to get another mortgage because you're not paying and you get some money walk away. Or you can put your house on the market. You got closing costs, realtor fees, transfer duty temps, depending what, where you are. So there is no doubt that it is very, uh, there's a huge benefit, but it's logical to us, right? To, for if you're an investor that say, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to sell my, my property and I'm going to get out. It's going to pay. I can take something affordable, but for people it's emotional, right? It's their home and their kids are there. Right. And so it's an emotional decision. So it's important that as logical you can be, you have to sort of give them the emotional component, you know what I mean? And almost sell the future of if they don't do it, what it would look like. And if they do what they would look like. Yeah. I've often told sellers too, that when they're behind on payments, if we take over their payments, we're going to make payments on time for now until we sell the property. It could be a year or two years. We could write it out, but that'll actually help improve their credit. So when their problems are behind them, they'll be back in a position. Yeah. And the question is that in theory that works, but we all know some of these people, if you're late on one thing, you're late on other things. And, right. and, um, but at the end of the day, you, they, maybe they walked away with money or they got saved from a very worse situation. Yeah. So, and also too, the mortgage being paid would actually help their credit because it shows they have a steady credit history of paying. And technically you're basically paying, they're helping the credit. Now the problem is that people, if you don't make the payments, you're basically screwing them. And I think that's wrong because people trusted you, right? And so I know you've never done that, but we've heard stories about doing that as well. 
Yeah, we have to do whatever it takes to keep those. Well, you know, your word is so they trusted you and you need to keep your word. And I think there's not a lot of that authenticity lately about in people's words. Okay. So you mentioned you prefer buying houses cash, right? And you had partners and things like that. So or my, or my money. <laughs> my money. Your own money, yeah, now. My money. Yeah, a lot of money. Over $56 million, I think, in the last uh, bond sold in the last two and a half years. So. Okay. So for somebody to just get started, maybe they don't have investment capital. Of their own. Well, that's my partner, right? You have money. I have money. Yeah. There's tons of people have money. But I don't invest in people. No, I don't invest in deals. I invest in people. Because a shitty person can ruin a great deal. They really can. I've seen this before so many times. Drama, egos, right? But a good person like those who are listening to this podcast and people like yourself will find a way. It may not be this deal, but it be another deal. But you have to remove yourself. You have to take a look at real estate. It's just like a numbers game. Like I got so desensitized earlier on to my first deal, the word no. I was like, I expected it. I was like, okay, next, 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 right? So you just have to push it. I mean, the number one skill in real estate investing, it's not knowledge or skill. I mean, having a right coach, someone like yourself, holding their hands. And, and I, what I like is that you take your clients on like, here, let, like, let's not sit in the ballroom or Zoom. Let's go see properties. So like, what do you say? Or let's see how it works in the office for real. And I think that's, that's what makes you different. That's why I think you've been very successful. But I think people need to, to, to be the most persistent person they know. It's a numbers game. The more offers you make, the more money you make, the more people you talk to, right? If you make one or two offers a week, that's not going to work. So, right, the odds are not going to be in your favor. So talk to a lot of people, make a lot of offers. You do it, I do it. Okay. So realistically, how many deals do you think people should be able to handle? It's a case by case, right? Because eventually I have to learn how to build a team and an organization like you have. You know, you have an amazing team here that works um, because you don't want to be a solopreneur. You have to learn how to build a team. Uh, and for people that are at that, that level yet, I don't think they should necessarily worry about it at, fir- at first, but they should definitely know about it, not worry about it, and not wait until they are ready because by then they kind of get stuck. And that's why... You know, I've had, I've been coached every week since the last 12 years. Like I have coaches, I bounce off ideas. Even if I know the answer now, 1% doubt can kill a deal or kill an opportunity. So, um, you know, I think, uh, it really depends, right? And uh, you get to sort of point afterwards and say, okay, well, maybe I got a little bit bigger deals now or be more, a bit more creative. But, you know, I just, the thing about real estate, I, I remember last year around this time, I think I had 19 closings in one month. That's a lot. You know, this month, none didn't buy anything, didn't do like because it's a game of chicken now in the market. And we're gonna see, start you know, buyers are holding out because they're like, I want a better deal, and sellers are like, Well, the market will turn, you know. So it's a wait and see, but we know that's not gonna last. So I think by your, your, it's coming. <laughs> right. So, what are some different strategies for a down market compared to an up market or buyer's market? Compared well, I bet I buy a market, you get a discount, you buy, and you pretty much guarantee to appreciate, right? Because the market is hot. In this market, you have to buy it at a great deal and sell it at a great deal. You know, I know you had two full price offers on your properties above uh, full price offers uh, because you priced it right, you made it amazing, and I think the price point of below five hundred thousand in this case of you had properties below three hundred thousand uh, in Texas. I, that's that's a very affordable price, right? We're seeing about five hundred thousand over a million. You know, there's a reason why I never did deals over a million dollars. Well, bigger deals, bigger profits. Yeah, also bigger losses if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I've always liked to stay in the median price range. You know? Yeah, well, that's how I built my empire, right? So I did my first 500 deals. I don't think any of the deals I did were over 500,000. Okay. So what's the biggest fear keeping people from getting started and doing that? Well, money. Uh, you know, I want to get I want to get the lenders right. I want to get my money lined up. I want to get the knowledge. And like, screw it let's do it like when you call agents or people like they need you so they don't know so i think practicing the art of the process getting a coach like someone like yourself who can hold your hand and show them around that's the key yeah i agree there's no such thing as a perfect deal right everybody seems to be waiting for that perfect deal where the numbers align everything makes yeah nothing's perfect you know nothing ever works the way you are You'd be like, oh, yeah, we'll buy this, we'll sell it this. I mean, you never know. Closing extensions, issues, lenders, cities, inspections, break-ins. Mm-hmm. Nothing ever works the way you do. So you sort of become desensitized. Yeah. Well, I believe coaching works. And well, it does. I mean, it does. I mean, you know, even I said 1% doubt can kill you. So just you just really focus on, you know, do I have the right information, the right team, um, you know, the, the right people and the right systems and the right coaching. If you do all that, you will succeed no matter what. Awesome.
So you think getting started now is the right time to start? No, I think people should wait and procrastinate. And when the stars of energies align themselves, Mercury and Venus, they should proceed, of course. Here's the thing, too. Even if you're not ready, you're never going to be ready. So you might as well just start. You know, to become successful, you have to be uncomfortable. You know, the first thing they do is they probably have a conversation with you and figure out what is their goals? What do they want? What do they achieve? How much money do they want to make? How big do they want to get? You know, it's just, do they want to do, you know, five properties in the next five years? Or they want to do, who, you know, five properties a month, right? It's a different strategy. It's a different amount of work. It's a different level of risk. Sometimes people want something, but they don't really want it. They just like the idea of it. Right. Some, like not everybody wants to quit their job in 90 days, right? To be a full Yeah, but, that, but the problem in real estate is that it's a, it, you can make short-term money. Like you talk about short-term ROI wealth, right? But, you know, it, from, they could buy a deal and from the time it started, it could be like six to nine months, right? So it's like a wheel, right? And after that, that's why you don't stop. Like, okay, I'm just going to work on one. And then it's because you're always going to start over. So you got to push, 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 push. So the guy that comes to me that does want to quit his job, like what, what, what do you recommend somebody quitting their job to be full-time real estate? Well, they got to make sure that whatever they do is eventually going to replace their income, right? right? Um, and also they got to take a look at their obligations, they have kids, they have like what their numbers are. So there's a lot of things. I mean, I started as 24, there's no money, there's no family, no nothing. So it's just, you know, that was a logical course. But, you know, there's people have certain obligations and... You know, what happens if, you know, can they afford not making money for a year, two years? I'm not saying it's, that's not going to happen, but can they afford it? Right. And if they can, then yes. If not, then no. But but the big mistake would be like, okay, I'm going to do this three months. If I don't make money, then I'm screwed. Like, that's a very bad, bad, bad way of looking at it. Correct. And people talk about passive income all the time. And I talk about like, okay, well, if you're going to replace $120,000 a year income, how many houses is it going to take at two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500 a month cash flow? to actually cover, you know, your income. So you can have that, what they call passive income. Yeah, passive income is a scam if yeah. you don't have any money. So I make a lot of money by not working. That's because my money makes work money for me, but that's, you need money to make money, right? That's the definition of passive income. And then even though I'm giving someone who has less money, you know, control of what they should do. So I, I like to put my money in people that have more money than me. So I was just the way I am because they also have more to lose, right? So... Sometimes we give our money to our financial advisors and then they just make less money than us. It just makes no sense. That's right. That's right. And that's why I like selling houses eventually, right? Instead of trying to accumulate all these properties and have all this passive income, selling a house and exiting. To make yeah, I mean, you make, I mean, you make, make more money so, exiting. Yeah. Obviously, there's tax advantages and depending how much money you need, some people hold it forever. But then they go, okay, so I got like $10 million in properties, but I haven't sold anything. And yeah, maybe you can refi, but eventually it catches up. And then, you know, who's responsible for that? Sometimes your kids, when you sell your properties, they're the ones stuck with the tax bill. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a give and take. So two different types of people. One would be the person with no money, but they have time. And one would be people with money. Um, but they don't have time. What, what advice would you give them? Because well, if you have no money, if you're born broke, it's not your fault. If you die broke, it's hundred percent your fault. So work ethic eliminates fear. You better be the hardest working group. A lot of offers, a lot of people, a lot of catch up because there's plenty of money out there as well. For the people that have money, I would suggest them to, you know, find someone like you to make sure that they're making the right decision or with the right people. And the number one skill they need to realize how to evaluate deals and not just say, okay, well, I don't know anything. I've got money. You go and do it. At least understand the basics of analyzing a deal. Trust, but verify. I agree. And I believe that you have to figure out the type of deal based on the motivation of the seller, right? Because everybody thinks and tries to put every deal into a box or a category, but it's a motivated seller that we're looking for, right? I agree. So... I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's great to be the first. Yeah. Sometimes the first are not really listened to as much because the first leads to everybody else building an empire. So hopefully, you know, this ends up being like, it, it, it's such as my first podcast were some of my best ones, but they're not as listened much because the, the brand grew. So people like to listen to the latest one, not the first one as well. So hopefully um, they will come back and listen to this. And I know a lot of people will listen because of your following or it as well, but it, it's such an honor. And I think it's a, it, it brought back a lot of stuff in memory lane about the first deal, which often shapes what kind of investor you want to be. So thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And that's a wrap for the show here today. If you'd like to hear my story and how I did my first deal, 
and extra footage from other people that I interview, there will be a link in the comment. Just click the link on the comment as well. In addition, if you'd like for me to fund your deals or you have some deals or capital that you'd like to fund for me, or if you'd like to be able to come to my office and check out exactly what we do every single day, the link is below. But that's it for today. If you also know and want to introduce me to people that would be great for me to interview on this podcast as well, that's always welcome. So do me a huge favor while you're still here, like and share this podcast on Spotify or Apple. It really helps out a lot, especially giving us a review. And we really appreciate everyone here today. We'll see you on the next time on your first real estate deal on the way to millions. All right, this is Philip Warwick and we'll see you next time.